This is the uh, second practitioner's panel that's going to look at the question of perspectives on Africa's security challenges. And uh, we have with us uh, three participants. Uh, you know, they have these great bio biographies here, but uh, I'm not going to work on them because they've been hanging out with us for the last two or three days. If you don't know them, you better get to know them. Um, but the issues that I, I'd like to say here is that, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on introductions only because it's, uh, it takes time away from the dialogue. And that's what we're going to have. We're going to have another conversation. Um, uh, the folks up here are going to, I'm going to pose three, two or three questions for them to consider as Africans looking at the questions that I'm going to pose to them and they can give their responses, their anecdotes to start that conversation. We'll continue with the back and forth a little bit up here amongst ourselves and then we're going to open it up to questions. So in, in terms of these questions, and, and uh, Linda will be the first guinea pig on all of this, um, is, you know, are African perspectives on the continent's security challenges different from those of its, its, its external partners? In other words, does the American or the French or the Chinese view towards uh, the security challenge in Africa different from what an African, uh, a Moroccan, a South African, uh, uh, someone from Kenya would look at? And what does this mean? And, uh, and how is it different? And why would it be different? I also want us to reflect on the conversation that came from when, when I think uh, Ben Nichols was talking about the, you know, the distinction between counterterrorism and countering violent extremism, and what does that mean? Within the continent, do uniformed and non-uniformed personnel view security differently? I think they do. Why? And what do these differing perspectives tell us about the approaches to addressing Africa's security challenges? Okay, I think that's important. Is different perspectives are not necessarily things to deal with in conflict, but actually can strengthen a response. If everyone's thinking the same way, you're going to be missing something. Right. So, those are the three questions, and I'm going to have Linda start off with this. Um, she is our is currently a research fellow in uh, the was it Ligon Center of International Affairs and Diplomacy at the University of Ghana. I am quite pleased that we're leading off this discussion with a female African, since that's who the average African is, is a female. And I also think that that's important for us to consider when we look at the questions of security, is that how do we utilize this tremendous resource that exists on the continent to address the problems of security, human security, civilian security, violent extremism, what I have seen is that there can be no security response, there can be no development response that is sustainable and durable in any part of the world if you ignore half of your population. I don't know, it just doesn't seem to work that way. And so with that, and with that burden, Linda. Thank you very much, Philip, and good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by reminding us that security goes beyond military security, as we all know. And so when you pose the question whether or not people on the continent and external partners have different views of security, my response is yes and no. Um, yes, because oftentimes the things that matter to us on a day-to-day -day basis are not necessarily the things that matter to our external partners. And I'll start off with the issue of climate change. Africa has been going through the challenges of climate change for a long time. When we talk about climate change, it is not just the loss of, you know, um, an environment for food production. We are also talking about the loss of medicinal plants, for instance, the loss of um, water bodies for, for heads. And who suffers the most when these things happen? It's the person at the lowest level, not necessarily the woman, but the person who does not necessarily have the resources to go to the hospital or take the child to the hospital when they are sick. But for years, when climate change was having negative effects on the continent, external partners were not as concerned as they are today. Um, what we see is now the securitization of aid, for instance. So all of a sudden, cry terrorism, and you get a lot of money to fight terrorism. But the space um, 
where other security threats are happening seem to be diminishing. In other words, all the resources have tended to go towards the kinetic measures for countering terrorism and not addressing the causes of terrorism. So the issues, and we've, we've heard a lot here um, in the last couple of days, the, the big or the, the youth bulge and the commensurate or the, the lack of um, opportunities available. Everybody is focused on let's go and get the bad guys. But what we are not doing is we are not preparing the next generation of young people to prevent them from becoming the next bad guys. And that doesn't seem to be part of the things that we are worried about very much. Um, so most of the concerns are focused on the symptoms and not necessarily the, the causes. And so why is it that a lot of money, for instance, is being spent or had been spent in East Africa? Most of the development assistance was spent on East Africa, not necessarily for development, but to counter Al-Shabaab and, and the, the others. Then also, um, I think that a lot of the efforts at addressing external partners' perceptions of security have actually helped to unravel some of the democratic gains that have been made on the continent. So increasingly, we hear that to be able to fight terrorism, you need to be able to listen to people's conversations. You need to know who is talking to who. And so what we had fought for over the years, and I'm not saying this shouldn't be done, but somehow talk terrorism, and that sort of gives you a carte blanche to doing everything negative. And so instead of going through the laid down regulations, the proper institutions to get the laws that you need to be able to do these things, governments are bamboozling their way through. And no, you know what? External partners look the other way around because it serves the interest of, of external partners. Now what we are trying to do, we have to bear in mind that Africa's fault lines continue to exist. So the issues of, and these are not necessarily threats, but they are fault lines. Uh -huh. So the issues of ethnicity, of religious diversity, of exclusion, they continue to exist. They haven't gone anywhere yet. And so when we look the other way, when rights are being abused, we only help to create a new narrative for the new bad guys. Um, well, and so I think when Parents are unable to save their children from dying from cholera, for example. They are not quite concerned about Al-Shabaab. And yet, this is our lived experience. I mean, in my country, in last year, we had an outbreak of cholera. We didn't make the news because it wasn't Ebola. It wasn't a big, a big, a big deal. But what we have seen, as well as we have focused on the so-called big deals, there are little things that have been left unattended to. So malaria continues to kill lots and lots of people on the continent. But somehow, it doesn't make the news because it doesn't affect the interest of the West uh, as much. So certainly, I think that what these different perspectives tell us is that we probably need to go back to the conversation that was begun in the late 90s, early um, 2000s, on having a whole of security approach. Somehow, I think we have misstepped. We have left that conversation. We are now chasing everywhere for bad guys, and yet, within our own domains, there are a number of security challenges that continue to provide, if you were, the, the, the material for exploitation, more or less. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, we need to address. Because Al-Shabaab will go, but another group will emerge. And that would be because we helped to create that other group. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for those wonderful comments. Um, Jonas is with, uh, well, you know, he has more degrees than I can think about. And, uh, you know, and he focuses on issues on peace studies and uh, conflict and conflict mediation. Um, and, you know, he's been around, he's been asking some very good questions from the audience, and now it's his turn to give it back. So, Jonas, it's all yours. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> Am I to address only one question or three of them at once? You can do what you want in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> That's great indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed, distinguished um, audience. Uh, one 
clear caveat is what I am airing out here does not necessarily represent either my institution or my country. It is just what we have been discussing so far, exercising Chatham House or academic freedom at the same time, of course. Okay, um, so our African perspectives on the uh, continent security challenge different or they differ from those of its external partners? If so, in what ways and why? Extremely interesting question. But yes, the answer again is an affirmative and negative because there are commonalities as well as specific or peculiarities as well. If I just focus only on one point here for our comparison, in regarding conflict analysis, causes of conflicts only, how to go about it, the uh, insiders, Africans, would like to look at the complexity of variables, not necessarily ethnicity as a cause, or climate as a cause, or not democratization or market economy as a cause, but they like to avoid monocausal and rather focus on multidimensionality. That makes difference, of course, internal from external. External, if I take from external, external are not one the same, there are very many. So if I simply take donors or euphemistically development partners, if I just take that one, they would like to address, unless you have democratization in your country, unless you have market economy, you can never ever address poverty issue because poverty leads you back again to conflict. That's just the way. This difference by itself has a huge impact on analysis and on understanding. So the best way for us in this regard is to try to, Yes, um, iron out the similar areas and then having partnership. And most important, challenging revisiting this African solution for African problem because African problem is not necessarily created by Africans themselves alone. It goes back mostly historically to colonialism, artificial boundary that divided to us one ethnic group into three or four high places, and of course many others very much related to that. So this idea of African solution for African, uh, African uh, problem is absolutely, to me, to be revisited and rethink. So that's also another area when we just deal with differences in, pers in perspective. Well, within the content, do uniform and non-uniform personal uh, view security differently? Oh, I must be careful here. Uh, this reminds me of Ethiopian saying that a cow delivered or gave birth to a fire and she wanted to lick but it burns her. She wanted to leave out but it is her offspring. She was in a dilemma. To say they are different would mean not recognizing what they have been contributing a lot. They are always there because I have most of the time military, defense, security in my MA and of course primary PhD programs and they would whenever I ask them to define security, they would straight go to state security, forgetting almost all, because they are on the mission, they are point people there. So Philip would say, well, unless you come back to me, then I have to mind my context as well. Therefore, yes and no again. Defining who the uniformed are. If they are really standing for simply a regime security, definitely they perceive differently. But majority of them, the civilian difficulty, the, dif the civilian problem also affects them. They are part and parcel of it provided they also see themselves in that perspective. So it depends upon who we are talking about. What do these differences or perspectives tell us about approaches to addressing Africa's security challenges? To my understanding, it implies sort of hybridization or cross-fertilization. It's time for us no country can say this is national security. They can think because Africa's security is America's security. America's security is Europe's security. It's so interrelated. Yesterday, Flip said an extremely important point there, if you, if you follow it carefully, butterfly effect. In one place, the vibration of the wing of butterfly in India affects earthquake in Francisco. That in complexity in algorithm theory, same time. 
it just this Al Shabab or Al Qaeda that affecting 9 11 in, in, in um, uh, America happens to be somewhere lack or poverty or maybe ideology or maybe caliphate thinking that grievance in one place affecting the other place. So currently, our thinking must also shift as a whole, not only simply paradigm shift by Co from Thomas Kuhn, but entire thinking because 21st century itself necessitates us to think again. So we have to think of global security, not only simply national security or sort of regional security. So that being the case, our researching must also align accordingly. So these differences in perspective also require innovative approach to researching, to dealing with conflict, violent conflict, particularly in Africa.